Hello, everyone. Welcome to our interview with Michael Batty. He has worked on computer models of cities and their visualization since the 1970s and has published several books, such as Cities and Complexity, which won the Alonzo Prize of the Regional Science Association in 2011, and most recently, The New Science of Cities. His work covers the science underpinning the technology of cities, and he has research interests in big data, urban morphology, and visualization. So, Michael, welcome. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Well, thank you, David. So, how had you come across the Building Beauty program? Okay, well, uh, I've known Sergio Porter for... Uh, a number of years, meeting him, I think, first of all, uh, in Italy at a conference, probably a conference on um, uh, urban planning, uh, methods in urban planning. Um, and uh, this was before Sergio uh, moved to the University of Strathclyde in Scotland uh, to be um, Professor of Architecture and Head of Department, uh, where he still is. So, uh, and I think uh, the other reason why I met him was that uh, as the editor of uh, the journal you've just mentioned, which is Environment and Planning B, this journal for many years has actually taken articles uh, which really relate to uh, urban morphology and building morphology uh, and systematic methods uh, in uh, characterizing, representing uh, buildings and cities. And Sergio, of course, uh, has done a lot of work uh, in the last 10 years on streets in that uh, in streets and their morphology using graph theory so uh, that was um, that was my first um, uh, link to the uh, the building uh, beauty project i also know uh, michael mahaffey uh, and um, again through the same sorts of links uh, and indeed um, i don't know i've never met but uh, i've been quite heavily influenced by many people uh, associated with this, uh, with the blog and the program and the website uh, by Christopher Alexander and his writings over the years from the time when I was a student in the uh, University of Manchester in the 1960s. Studying in Manchester in the 1960s, what really got you going on your track of study? What problems did you see at that time that you really thought needed solving, that, uh, that you've been bringing uh, solutions to bear upon. Okay, so um, I trained um, uh, as an architect planner. Um, uh, that's my original training. Um, and um, in the uh, time when I trained, um, uh, the degree program at uh, the University of Manchester was uh, a program that was really divided into two parts, as many architecture programs still are, that you do uh, a three-year sort of foundation course and then really two years professional. Now, a number of programs then divided at the end of year three, uh, you'd taken your degree in the profession, in the, uh, in the basic uh, foundation, uh, and you divided into planning or architecture to enter the, uh, to, to, to enter the profession. And I, I chose planning. Um, and during the uh, two years when I followed the planning program, um, there was a very strong emphasis on new methods emerging in planning, mainly from the United States. Um, computers were being used for the first time uh, quite extensively in land use and transportation, so it's much influenced by that. Um, but more importantly, in terms of the, uh, uh, the program we're talking about here, the building uh, beauty.net, um, that I was influenced by uh, design, basically, methods of design and optimization. And it was pretty natural that we picked up on uh, the writings of people like Christopher Alexander, who was very um, central, really, uh, instrumental, really, in terms of thinking about design methods. Uh, there were other people at Manchester. J. Christopher Jones was in industrial design. Uh, there are people in, in, uh, in the UK, such as Bruce Archer and so on, who we were introduced to as well. Uh, so to some extent... Um, I really uh, was uh, um, uh, fascinated by the de these developments of systematic approaches, not only to cities, which was our 
basic uh, uh, basic basic work in this sense, but uh, but also to their actual design. So it was it was using um, systematic methods. I won't make it any stronger than that, but systematic methods, relational methods uh, of various sorts to look at uh, cities and design. So that's really how I got into it in this sense. Excellent. So it sounds like notes on the synthesis of form and that neighborhood of thought would have been uh, something on your on your radar at the time. Very much so. That this was the uh, uh, this was the first. Um, uh, this was really the, the one of the few books really on um, uh, ideas about design, systematic design, uh, and indeed um, uh, many of us uh, uh, in our year. Um, uh, read uh, the book when it was published, which was Alexander's thesis, of course, his, his PhD. Uh, we read the book and um, it gelled very well with <clears throat> the kind of thinking that was going on uh, in urban planning at the time, which was uh, the idea of uh, rational design uh, in some senses, but at the same time, the idea of uh, articulating a problem of design uh, into a series of sub problems in some sense. Um, and analyzing them in this sense and then building a kind of a synthetic um, method or superstructure to put these problems, uh, these subproblems back together with a view to solution in that sense, the idea of the hierarchy or the, uh, the lattice-like structure where you uh, compromised and uh, produced good fit between the parts. So this was a very important method. Now, of course, in urban planning at the time, uh, the urban planning programs really dealt not just with cities, they dealt with different scales. And one of the scales that was pretty characteristic of uh, various projects we did was the village scale. So Alexander's work on villages, in particular his appendix in the notes on the census of form uh, of the Indian village, basically, was pretty central in that way. Now, when we finished the, um, uh, the degree in planning, I stayed... Uh, to do a PhD, to do a doctorate, basically. And indeed, my uh, thesis title, uh, ultimately it didn't turn out that way, but my thesis title was essentially the application of design methods to uh, village planning in that sense. It sounds like there was a lot of focus on analyzation of method, of decomposing and uh, recomposing architectural problems in order to... Uh, refine the tools that you were working with uh, with architecture is is that how you would characterize it? Yes, um, one of the features I think of um, urban planning, city planning at that particular point was the notion that um, I suppose for the first time there was a strong movement to uh, which sort of said that before we design the city, we've really got to understand it that. Uh, understanding and design were um, uh, two sides, different sides of the same coin in this sense. So that was a very, very strong um, uh, kind of message and paradigm, really, that we ascribe to. Um, uh, and of course, to some extent, it's now a, a kind of a, um, uh, it's now really um, uh, something that's uh, well, quite widely accepted, the notion of understanding a problem before you do anything about it. Um, uh, and in that sense, um, uh, we gave equal weight to some extent to ideas about how cities functioned uh, and ideas about how we should design that functioning in some sense. Uh, and similar sorts of methods were being used to uh, think about um, uh, the understanding of cities. So, for example, flows and networks and interactions and trip making patterns were the kind of fodder, if you like, of the land use transport models that uh, represented the cutting edge uh, of uh, those tools at the time, uh, and then also the idea of relationships and interactions in terms of the uh, the various components that constituted the design problem in that sense. So there was a sort of a, um, a synergy between thinking of the city in these terms and thinking of design in these terms. In fact, in my own case, I quite heavily concentrated on the, on the former uh, rather than the latter. In other words, I mainly spent my career since then and since then uh, working on understanding the city and uh, building uh, computer simulation models of the city. I've still kept an interest uh, in design, largely, I think, because, uh, you know, I was tra trained in it back then. 
uh, but also because um, it's still uh, an important uh, element, uh, increasingly important element to uh, uh, to understand design, etc., and to to produce good design. So I'm still very much a believer in design methods with a, a small d and a small m in a sense, rather than a kind of capital D and a capital M in that sense. So design methods to me are still important in that sense. Um, so so really um, it, through the 1970s. When I began my academic career, I've mainly worked on um, uh, ideas about uh, uh, ideas about how we build uh, simulation models. Uh, uh, in that sense, that's the operational side of things. But I've also worked a bit on um, uh, more general ideas about systems. And then uh, you mentioned the book I written about uh, ten years ago called Cities and Complexity. Uh, that book really is a sort of um, uh, bringing all of the the ideas about complexity theory, which are very resonant, I think, with uh, what Chris Alexander has said many times in his books, all the way through from notes to uh, the nature of order. Um, the idea of complexity in cities is something that I've worked on quite uh, a lot in the last 10 years or so. Uh, and uh, in particular, notions about urban morphology, fractals, things of that sort. So all of this kind of mix of stuff really relates quite strongly, I think, to um, many, or it's very complementary, I think, to many of the uh, perspectives that the different members of the um, uh, uh, the Building Beauty sort of project really, you know, aspire to in that sense. And indeed, I think it's quite consistent with what uh, uh, Chris Alexander has done, um, you know, throughout his life in this sense. Oh, certainly. I'd agree very much. Our staff member, Bin Zhang, uh, we have an inter a text interview posted where he goes on about his mathematical research into analyzing beauty, architectural, and urban structure. In the sense of combining those two aspects of the understanding of fractals and complexity theory, as well as learning from the city structure in order to approach problems with those two things in mind. Over the years with your work in this, how have you found uh, that to pan out? What types of things have you discovered? Okay, well, um, in some senses, the, the message of complexity theory is, is one which suggests that, that rather than plan from the top down, we should act if you like and interact and dis and uh, make uh, make changes from the bottom up and to some extent the difference between the sort of systems top down kind of approach to life and the uh, the kind of more evolutionary bottom up approach to life um, is is to some extent uh, um, similar to what Chris Alexander said in his notes book on uh, the unselfconscious and the self-conscious in that sense, in terms of design. So um, uh, many of the things we've thought about in the last 10, 20 years uh, pertaining to cities have turned, if you like, the planning system on its head, really, in that sense. And, uh, you know, we, I tend to think of cities as, as being um, largely unplanned in some sense, but that doesn't mean to say that they're not ordered uh, the, the fractal idea suggests that there is order at uh, many scales, it emerges. The fractal idea is the idea of emergence and self-similarity and things of that sort. Uh, and so that's something that we've done a lot of work on um, uh, and uh, in, in various ways that um, I wrote of one of my books was called Fractal Cities, which was written um, uh, with my co-author Paul Longley in the uh, early 90s, basically, which... Um, uh, really kind of developed this idea about fractal mor morphology, uh, building on work which was going on in physics by people like Gene Stanley and so on, uh, and indeed uh, going really back to the theoretical geographers of the 50s and 60s who, they didn't call it fractals, they didn't call it complexity, but uh, ideas in central place theory and scaling and allometry and things of that sort, all kind of are part and parcel of this sort of move towards thinking about uh, morphology really from the bottom up. So uh, a lot of what we've been doing um, is, uh, is, is based on this paradigm, if you like, of, uh, of complexity in that sense. Indeed, you mentioned Bin Yang. I mean, Bin Yang was a, a postdoc in, uh, in our center here in CASA, 
that was his first job before he went to, to Sweden in that sense. And so um, uh, it's nice to think that, uh, you know, what we were doing back then is something that he's picked up and, and run with in terms of uh, ideas about streets and uh, order and uh, uh, self-similarity and fractals and so on. Um, uh, anyway, the, you asked the question about, you know, what, what do we feel that we've done in this area? Well, I mean, it's like everything. It's unfinished business in many senses. And I'm a fairly strong believer that um, as we learn more about the world, um, uh, we learn, in fact, that it's, uh, you know, deeply complex and mysterious in some senses uh, without using the term mystery in some sort of uh, a kind of off-the-wall sense, basically, but using the idea of mystery as being uh, the kind of focus to uh, to spur us on to better understanding. So, so what I'm really saying is the more we learn, as it were, the more we realize we need to learn, in a sense, uh, about life. And I think that's something that uh, uh, does distinguish um, uh, ideas um, now, as it were, from ideas perhaps uh, 50 or 100 years ago, uh, it's it's really an abandonment of the model uh, that suggests that uh, we live in a clockwork universe, etc. There's a million different ways uh, in which that model has been questioned anyway, in that sense, even basic physics itself and the quantum and uh, relativity really sort of, uh, you know, basically doubt this kind of notion of, uh, you know, an all ordered sort of mechanism out there but i think in in a sense that's something we've learned to live with but that's collectively and i think that's true that's true i think of uh, designers it's true if you like of uh, the very thing that uh, we started to talk, that i started to talk about the idea of design methods that design methods some people say they were discredited etc they did not lead to the promised land and so on uh, but my view is much more uh, generous in a sense it's it's that this was a way of getting going and we were bound to learn about the limits of these things and that does not really discount any of the kind of basic ideas about looking at design in a in a rational and um, uh, comprehensive kind of fashion in that sense well I'd, I'd agree with that uh, a lack of an ultimate perfect tool doesn't mean that you shouldn't focus on improving the tools themselves one thing that I thought was very interesting that you mentioned uh, about the abandonment of the clockwork universe, so to speak, what what some people have called the mechanistic worldview, is that this touches on a really central anxiety within architecture today and and art generally, and that is that a focus on method can sometimes uh, trigger people into worrying that you're going to take all the sense of the personal out of it. However, if this analysis of method is not coming from the top-down mechanistic worldview, it seems that that anxiety is rooted in reaction to an old view that would have brought a deterministic attitude to methods. And so these, these new bottom-up methods are um, certainly many of them non-deterministic. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's often done in pursuit of values such as uh, a wholeness, uh, life, beauty within the environment that uh, really enriches things for, for people and places. And how would you, with with your experience negotiate the sense of method and the sense of determinacy or indeterminacy in, in terms of trying to find a, a solution that way. Sure. Sure. It's a very good point. I mean, um, and it's manifested in many different ways, I think, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what we all do and aspire to do. Um, I think one of the key issues is that, um, the mechanistic model, as it were, the world as a or, or, or society as a machine, really, which to some extent um, dominated uh, the development of science and social science in the first 50 years of the last century. Uh, that particular mechanistic model gave way, uh, it really, in the uh, in the last uh, quarter, uh, certainly the last 50 years, but certainly the last quarter of the 
20th century to this notion of um, uh, thinking of society as more like an organism in that sense, that there was this switch from machine to organism uh, in this particular context, which is the switch from, you know, top down to bottom up. And of course, to some extent, it was pre- um, it's predated by the, the emergence the emergence of the ideas about evolution, you know, in the middle of the uh, 19th century. I mean, uh, I mean, it took 50 years at least for Darwin's uh, uh, notions about how we evolved, etc., and how, uh, how how animal and uh, uh, plant populations, etc., uh, evolved in that sense to uh, to even uh, uh, occupy the uh, the time of day with many people, and um, even today it's. Uh, uh, it's doubted in some quarters, but nevertheless, the uh, the idea of evolution, I think, is is very much something that um, uh, now really underpins uh, a lot of social science and, and and science itself, and that has brought onto the table, I think, immediately this notion that um, as things evolve, there is uh, there is noise and there is error um, and there is uh, uh, difference, etc. Uh, which all combine together to mean that we cannot forecast um, precisely in any sense uh, what is likely to happen in the future. So the evolutionary paradigm, in my view, is very consistent, entirely consistent with notions about indeterminism and uh, uh, indeed in terms of uh, models of evolution, they're essentially probabilistic in that sense. Now that has had and in, I mean, that and also, I think, thinking about uh, uh, scientific methods and so on and the the notion that we can't really prove, certainly in human populations in society, we can't really prove anything to be true. All we can do is, you know, demonstrate that it might be false. I mean, this is Karl Popper's sort of uh, uh, theory about science. Um, uh, that combined with evolutionism in, in some sense, evolutionary thinking, you know, has led to the notion that we have a very different view or an increasingly different view about our ability to predict the future than we did 100 years ago in that sense. And so that's injected a massive indeterminism and uncertainty into modern life that uh, we kind of know we can't uh, predict. Well, we used to think that we couldn't predict in the medium and long term. We now know that we can barely predict in the very short term in that sense. Um, and all sorts of uh, uh, disciplines and fields, etc., are subject to the critique that really, um, why are we doing it if we can't predict? Basically, economics, of course, is the classic example in this particular context. So so this is a kind of uncertainty that we're, 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 we're having to face face on and, and to actually begin to live with in some senses. Now, I think that um, that is exactly characteristic of some of the things you were saying about uncertainty and indeterminism and uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the probabilistic future in this particular context. Now, what it does for design is um, is very difficult. To, I mean, I, I am not somebody who is best equipped to actually, you know, philosophize about the implications of this for design. I mean, I think it... Uh, it does change the idea of design in some sense. Um, it tends to, I think, push design more onto the notion of um, uh, <clears throat> the idea of a collective design from the bottom up in some senses uh, in, in this particular context rather than uh, design from the top down. But there, is, there are some you know, major conundrums and dilemmas really you know, in terms of what it means for you know, highly centralized design in that sense. And, and, and I use the word design um, in a general sense. I mean, you could say highly centralized anything for that matter, highly centralized policy making, um, uh, anything of that sort. Certainly. Uh, I think one of the tight ropes that this indeterminacy you're discussing implies uh, that has thrown a uh, very thorny critique in the world of design, especially from uh, what people call the uh, postmodern perspective, mm -hmm. is to call into question objectivity. Uh, it's, it's very easy to, uh, I would call it a conflation, to, to bring together uh, the lack of, uh, of top-down stricture uh, 
uh, to mm. automatically come with uh, a, a radical uncertainty about uh, any type of even un even intersubjectivity, mu much less objectivity. However, the challenge with design is that your end product is necessarily an objective fact within the shared reality of these multiple individuals in a const context that is constantly changing. And especially regarding your experience on analyzation of method, how do you feel that that challenge is best met with what tools uh, in order to discover objectivity or work for it? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very major issue, the extent to which um, we really view the world as being objective or relativist. Um, and uh, it also relates, I think, to questions of certainty that um, uh, it's easy to uh, think, uh, think of the world now as being um, so complex uh, that we need to develop many different perspectives um, on how we uh, act and interact with each other, uh, which are all personal and all relative to one another uh, in this context. Now, none of this, of course, helps to think about anything that is uh, objective in some sense. It's all uh, relative in that context. Uh, so consequently, um, the difficulty... The difficulty we have with uh, with acting, really, is that there are many different models that we can use, all of which appear to be um, plausible in some sense, many of which do not appear to be easy to uh, bolt together, to integrate in some sense. So we're left in this kind of pluralistic kind of maze, really, of uh, thinking about what we might do. How can we ensure some kind of objectivity uh, in this particular context. And I don't know that I have a, a very uh, definite answer to this to some extent. I tend to think of myself as being a pluralist. So somebody comes along and tries to, um, and, and I tell them how something that I think about in the city actually works or how I uh, assume it works, etc. From a certain perspective, it might be using a bit of economic theory, a bit of transportation theory. Somebody else comes along and, and uh, gives me a different, um, a different view of that same phenomenon from their perspective. And they argue that uh, there are many cultural factors involved in what happens and so on. So you, you have immediately two different views of the same phenomena. Uh, and in some senses, I tend to um, very much think that, they, that, that these views are often complementary. They're not necessarily contradictory. And so they're, they're very different very often. And, and you can't really see how you could integrate them, etc. And so to some extent, you immediately have an object or a problem, basically, that can be seen in more than one way. Now, now that's something I think that, that we're increasingly seeing. And it makes life very hard, I think. It's, it's, it's very much against the traditional notion that there is one science, one machine out there, one clockwork, if you like, in this particular context. So objectivity is something that I think is highly problematic in this particular context. Um, uh, the way we deal with it, I mean, in terms of our own research into how cities function, uh, we tend to adopt fairly well-mapped um, uh, views about how cities work. We tend to think they work, you know, in terms of markets, we're well aware that uh, many markets are imperfect and don't work in the way that you read about it in the economics textbooks, but uh, cities work in terms of land markets, housing markets, things of that sort. Um, the, uh, people, uh, uh, you know, compete for different kinds of travel, uh, etc. And so there is a sort of rudimentary theory, if you like, which is which is strongly plausible and useful in some senses uh, in terms of thinking how the city works. Now, there are lots of things that lots of assumptions we must make about the city um, uh, to actually adopt those sorts of models, really. But it's almost like saying whatever model you adopt about thinking about urban problems, say, uh, then um, you have to make 
some quite severe assumptions in this particular context. Also, in terms of developing robust um, uh, models in some sense, which are useful for understanding, there are many assumptions that we have to take on faith um, and we can't really test them. I mean, one of the problems in trying to test a model of a complex system is that invariably the model is much simpler than the complex system uh, that it's trying to represent. Um, and therefore, um, uh, very often it uh, is, is simpler because we can't collect the data and we can't articulate all the processes that uh, give rise to the complexity. Uh, but there is a kind of a, uh, there is a mismatch with respect to our ability to actually validate or to convince, if you like, that uh, these approaches are, you know, uh, robust in the traditional scientific sense. That's a major issue, I think. Uh, in other words, the scientific method, as we as it's mapped out, really, is no longer really very useful for the kind of problems and systems that we're dealing with. You would feel that the scientific process necessarily has a distinction between a model and an application uh, between which you feel there would uh, there would be a certain amount of uh, slip which you'd want to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, if you look at science, then um, traditional uh, science, I think, or classical science, let's say, back to the you know 17th century, the Enlightenment and so on. Classical science from then on until the late 19th century, I think, was very much this notion that there was a high degree of certainty. Uh, many of the experiments were done were under relatively controlled situations. So the kind of complexity of, of the real world was dismissed to some extent and theory was developed, very successful theory um, in this particular context. And then um, as we embraced ever more complex systems, if you like, through the 20th century, um, then um, uh, our, our context for defining good science began to change. And so consequently, um, really, it wouldn't have made any, well, arguably, you know, whether we've made progress or not is arguable, but we wouldn't really have made any progress at all in terms of a science of society or the social sciences you know, had we not had the development of these artificial laboratories called computers, basically, uh, because we couldn't, you know, set up a social co context that could be completely controlled in any sense, like in a laboratory. We couldn't, you know, sort of do the sort of science that was done in classical mechanics and so on. Uh, so consequently, you know, the computer became the laboratory in that sense. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of classical science, once it was put out in the field, uh, really falls apart just like social science in the sense that weather forecasting is a, a classic example in this, that uh, all the laws of, uh, of physics uh, are rel relative to or classical laws, uh, you know, hold in terms of weather. But when we put it all together, right, uh, then the predictability in weather forecasting is fairly minimal. It's getting better, um, uh, but it's, it's relatively minimal to the kind of basic science in the laboratory, which really informs it. So I think that that's a major issue uh, in terms of uh, uh, how, how science gets applied. Uh, and so we start with theory, and then the word model has become very significant, meaning that it's close to the theory, but it's not the same as theory. And then, of course, applications. You can think of a whole chain of models all the way through to applications, which basically lose a little bit of variety and gain different things as we actually... Uh, move through in a way. So, in other words, that the whole chain from theory to application uh, is now uh, is now has different elements to it, uh, and the slippage you referred to can take place at any stage between that. In some senses, the slippage may, may we may need to to have some slippage because basically, to get to the ap applicable science stage. Uh, we need to modify the science in that sense slightly, we modify the model. Certainly, it requires uh, adaptability, yeah. uh, which, which has been a, a very significant watchword in architecture. Just before we wrap up here, you had mentioned that the methods of science were not necessarily matching everything that we wanted it to serve uh, in in this area. What types of new areas, especially in regards of what 
can be and will be investigated um, you know within the building program of Naples where people are able to get you know hands-on on the ground reaction to what is being built with empirical tests possible in that way what would you look forward to in terms of challenging scientific method and uh, attempting to break new ground uh, in terms of how problems can be uh, addressed in this uh, di in the different way that these problems you're discussing seem to require? Well, I think there's one very obvious thing that is happening very extensively in modern life, and that is uh, the movement from a material to a digital kind of context in many ways. And um, uh, for example, in the context of architecture and cities and building, um, it's very clear now that uh, computers, for example, um, which we traditionally use to actually help us to understand uh, buildings and cities and design and so on better, are now being embedded into the very things that, uh, the very subject matter that we're seeking to understand with the same things. So in other words, the emergence, if you like, of the smart city is uh, a classic example of this. The computers and sensors are being embedded into the fabric of cities, and they're giving us lots of data about understanding, but they're changing the nature of the city. Um, and that is quite profound, this notion of changing the nature of the city. I would also say that that's being accompanied by an increasing complexity of the city, that one of the one of the difficulties of developing science and social science uh, through models and, uh, and, uh, and theories and so on uh, in cities and in building is that, um, uh, is that as those buildings are changing all the time um, uh, our, uh, and the cities are changing, they're getting more complex, uh, then it, the, our theories are, uh, are in search of a moving target, really. So... So in some senses, cities, the very the very thing we're dealing with is getting more and more complex through time. And that's uh, it, it's due to technology, of course, but it's also due to the fact that people have greater flexibility in life, greater wealth, things of that sort and so on. So so in other words, we have this sort of moving target, basically. So it seems to me that um, uh, all of this change will will lead us to a rather different way of understanding, a rather different way of science in some senses. So, uh, and I can't really be very specific about this because I don't really know what it would be, but I have a feeling there will be some pretty big changes, you know, in the next 20, 30 years. You know, the second thing that's, that's happening um, uh, really relates to um, the way we the way we use our models, I suppose, um, in this particular context, that, uh, uh, well, it's the way, it's, it's what we use them for. And one of the things that has come onto the agenda in a big way, in city planning particularly, and to a lesser extent, I, probably also in architecture too, although architecture has always been closer to it, is this notion that the temporal element of the system we're dealing with has actually changed. So in terms of cities, we used to think in terms of time spans of maybe one year, two year, five year, 20 year, in terms of thinking of the future of the city. What the smart city has brought to us is the notion that some of the really important things in cities are taking place second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour. So that the temporal span has increased massively uh, over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, in the sense that, um, uh, you know, we're much more concerned with, um, uh, you know, recording what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the 24-hour city. Uh, we simply couldn't do it in the past, basically. We didn't have the computers to do it. So we've, we've also got this change in the temporal dimension. So you've got increasing complexity, um, changes in the temporal dimension, etc. All of this, uh, changes in data and so on that's coming from all of this stuff, and I think all of this is actually going to change the science uh, and perhaps even the way we do the science, etc. I'm not talking about anything very, very dramatic that we couldn't um, uh, that we couldn't really understand in any sense. But I'm thinking about how all of this comes to be together is not very is not clear at the present time. But there will, I think, be some changes in that sort of in, the, in, in our perspective on 
on how we do science and indeed how we do design really in that sense. And this is certainly a very dynamic time for architecture and all of these investigations. Well, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, David. I enjoyed it. Yes, thank you.